what I'm actually talking about today uh, is utilizing dynamic creative uh, within your social campaigns. Um, specifically, a, a couple things that I want to do are, are, are talk about kind of fundamental differences between dynamic creative and display campaigns, how this differs from social, and that how you can actually kind of have this uh, as like a full-on uh, solution. So dynamic creative basically is uploading a bunch of different uh, assets and different elements to your ad campaigns then letting a system kind of optimize and converge on those so it's a way to it's a way to kind of like work on hitting a different target audience but also to make things more efficient for your ad team so uh, when i'm done with this kind of things that i want you to do are be able to kind of like understand some of the fundamental differences between how we view dynamic creative for display and social so I'll, again i'll go over and i'll talk about how dynamic creative uh what it what it entails in, in, in display, which is super complex, and then what it entails in social and why they're different, and how you can action on this. Um, this will also help you approach your marketing funnel and your campaigns from a completely new lens. Um, a, a lot of the, the uses for dynamic uh, creative kind of tend to be in the retargeting funnel um, and to kind of improve your retargeting pools. So I think it's important to kind of like understand how you can start looking at your funnels differently. Um, from there, you can also use the data that you're getting from these campaigns to actually craft different user personas. Um, so you understand more and more about who the actual people that you're, you're appealing to and that you're marketing to so you can deliver more efficient ads to them. Um, and then you can plan dynamic campaigns between your creative teams uh, and your media team so that you're managing proper communication between everybody. I, I feel like that's something that should go without saying, right? Like we all have to talk to one another, but... Um, what's the scientific word sometimes between creative and media i think shit show uh sometimes when everybody's going at it so we've all been there so hopefully i can give you some some ways to kind of improve on that give me a second here i'm gonna hit this timer so i don't i'm tend to be no well, doesn't want to work this one i tend to be long-winded uh, so arguably my favorite side of the presentation though is the 30 seconds where i get to talk about myself um, <laughs> I'm actually really boring in real life. I call that out here. Um, I like to use this headshot. It makes me look cooler than I am. Um, my name is Chris Apoliski. I'm the senior director of paid social at AdLucent. We're an agency out of Austin, Texas. I live a couple, uh, couple hours north in Dallas. Um, and, uh, yeah, I run the entire social program there in, in the team. So, uh, as far as just quick personal things about me, music is a big hobby. You can guess that by I'm still rocking the hair even at this age, but you know, eventually we'll see. <laughs> and hockey and baseball, uh, two big sports of mine. Dallas Stars breaking my heart since they lost the cup in 2000. Uh, I'm in Houston, so I just won't talk about baseball. I'm not sure if it's too soon for that, so apologies. Um, quick slide, uh, just about ad lucent. Uh, like anybody else's agency, digital, uh, we run the gambit, you know, display, search, social, uh, Google's largest shopping ad agency about 1.5 billion of annual uh, media managed. Um, tons of clients, tons of uh, you know campaigns, tons of teams. I look it up, read about us, the whole, the whole nine yards. I know you guys aren't here to, to listen to a spiel about AdLucent, so we'll go on. Okay, so as I mentioned, dynamic creative. Um, a lot of times, you know, dynamic creative optimization and display and dynamic creative versioning and social get confused as the same thing. Uh, context clues on this slide will tell you they're not. Um, so if that's what you were guessing, you were absolutely right. Uh, dynamic creative uh, optimization is displayed in display media, while dynamic creative versioning is a facet of social. Um, they, they have similar goals, obviously. We're looking at uh, uploading and breaking ads into like different elements, but they function inherently differently. So there's benefits to doing this instead of just building fully formed ads. Um, and then A, B testing, but instead like building up an ad of components and then multivariate testing, right? Uh, one of these is reaching the right person at the right time, which I know is, you know, super cliche at this point. Like we all know we're trying to reach the person at their stage in the journey of the funnel, but it does kind of help kind of hone in on, on where that person is. Uh, another thing here is it helps avoid creative fatigue. I mean, if you see an ad the same ad over and over and over again, what are you likely to do? But you're likely to tune that ad out and stop caring, right? Um, 
which which sucks as advertisers feeling like you know you put all your heart into something and then people just don't care anymore so like how can you kind of uh it sounds like i've been burned by that before it doesn't like i'm almost sad about it <laughs> but so you know how can you kind of uh, avoid creative fatigue there um you can craft stronger personas right so you're getting tangible signals from the data that that, that you collect so i know like everybody and their dog works for a data driven agency um, but the reason why we all say that we do is because that you're collecting data about people and then you're turning and using that data to guide decisions. If you can find ways to get better data for people, um, then why not use that, right? Sounds like I have a career working at Facebook, right? Like if you can get everybody's personal information, you can know about them. Uh, <laughs> you'll be able to execute more efficient retargeting campaigns with dynamic creative, right? So again, the whole purpose of this is when you get people down the funnel, to that kind of a lower funnel on point of purchase, basically, that you can actually you know, convince them that, that they need to buy your product or your service or your good or take the intended action there. Uh, and then you're also creating personalized experience at scale. So it kind of helps people say, feel as if like they're being marketed to specifically. And once you kind of hit that personalization aspect, then, then you're more likely to get somebody to convert. So again, Really quick, I'm gonna talk about what this is in display, uh, just so that we can spend the bulk of the time talking about social uh, and why, why the two differ from each other. So a lot of times my creative peeps will be like, oh, we need to run this DCO campaign, and it's like, it's not the same thing. Like social is like a little bit like DCO light kind of thing. Um, so again, what is DCO then in, in display? Uh, it's display ad technology, it, it creates personalized ads. So it's basically on the data about the user the moment that they're served of an ad, okay? So it's real-time personalization. It's, it's, it's deconstructing everything into different assets, different asset libraries, and giving a marketer and advertiser uh, the ability to kind of vary their creative delivery, right? Uh, so it's a real-time and it's on a per-impression basis. Uh, again, you'll hear me harp on this in both display and social. One of the primary uses here is retargeting. Um, it's really, really kind of focusing on people when they're at that final stage of the funnel. And you want to boost your performance, right? So your dynamic ads are often performing better than their static counterparts. I mean, we're looking at like even sometimes like a 25 to 30% lift in performance that we've seen. That's huge. That helps a lot. Um, so how does this work then in social? or excuse me, in display, there's five different ways, right? So the first way is we're kind of like identifying, we're, we're creating a hypothesis, right? So like, what's the main pain point of your audience and what are we trying to solve? Uh, and then as I mentioned, we're templatizing everything. So we're deconstructing ads into different asset libraries. So think of when you see an ad, every individual component of the ad and then breaking that down and then actually waiting for a smart intelligence system to converge on everything. Um, you set a learning agenda from there. So basically, what are you trying to learn? You know, are you concerned with how somebody is responding to your creative? Are you concerned with like messaging or sequenization or something of that nature? Um, and then you assemble decision trees based on where you think somebody's going to go or what path that they can take. And then from there, what you're going to do is optimize on, on your ads because we're running advanced testing methods. What this is, is multivariate testing. You're not just A-B testing, building a fully formed ad, throwing in a sandbox and going from there. Um, so a dynamic approach differs from your standard approach, right? Because with a standard approach, you have a mass message approach. You build an ad, you throw it out in market, and then see how it performs. With a dynamic approach, you can market to specific segments, okay? Um, this helps in the production process because when you're uh, in a traditional workflow, it, everything is, is just linear, right? You're building an ad, uh, you're you're seeing how it performs, you're A-B testing, you're throwing them back in market over and over and over again. Now, if it's template-based, then you can kind of kind of cut the BS a little bit, upload everything and see how it, um, how it performs. Uh, the testing potential then obviously in a standard approach is limited. Um, I'm gonna be honest with you guys, I hate myself for using the word robust on a slide, but I can't like do anything about it now, it's there. Um, so your testing potential is robust in dynamic uh, approach, right? In other words, your multivariate testing, you have more uh, ability to test and learn. Um, and with a standard approach, your, your updates in, into campaigns and, and your trafficking times can be delayed. Uh, you can reduce this uh, with a dynamic approach just in the sense that you're spending less time deliberating on building ads. Um, you can't do this by yourself. You need to use a vendor. This isn't necessarily an endorsement of any of these vendors, but specifically if you're interested in this and you wanted to take it back and you would say, hey, well, where do I even start with that? So 
the nice thing alone is since it's complex uh, in display, it's not as if you're just sitting in a, you know, I don't know, like a dimly lit basement, like, oh my God, this campaign. So, you know, at least like, you know, that there's, there's help on the way, right? So my bread and butter, um, social, obviously, uh, dynamic creative versioning in your social campaign. So now we know how it's working in a display, but then how do we turn around and apply this to social and specifically what is it in social and how can we build out and target better, right? Um, I like to think of uh, DCV, as I call it, dynamic creative versioning, and social is kind of like DCO light, right? So it's not as many, um, you're not, there's not as many like levers that you need to pull, also a phrase that I hate, so I'm just kind of knocking them all out of the park today. Um, <laughs> but you're looking at like optimized ad combinations, right? So you're looking at the components of an ad, uh, but specifically it's limited in the ones that you can use. And much like DCO, the, converge, the system is going to converge on different components of these assets, right? Um, so what's happening then um, is you're putting an ad out and then you're putting it on Facebook specifically here because DCB is uh, a facet of Facebook. And then it's optimizing on the creative components. So say that you're in the prospecting funnel and you're on a traffic objective and your main KPI is like landing page view rate and that's what you're tracking towards. You're looking at different combinations of images, text, calls to action, that sort of thing. Uh, that you're, you know, the system knows that like people are likely to kind of click and take that action. And so then it's converging on that, but it's doing it while you're uploading everything at once in the back end. So as I mentioned, you're performing, uh, you're serving ads to the highest performing creative combinations. Um, you know, it's a great tool because we're trying to learn more about what creative resonates with people. Um, as a marketer and advertiser, I think this is something that we're always like really, really obsessing over. Uh, really trying to like hit that right person in their journey. So it kind of helps that to learn stuff about it, right? Why do you do this kind of stuff then? Like, what's the point? And everything we do is because you're trying to solve a problem. At least that's how my day goes. I, I solve problems. Uh, getting older is weird, by the way. Like, so I, I, like, I made a Pulp Fiction reference the other day. And like, you know, there's a bunch of people at work that are like 24 and stuff. And like nobody... I solved the problem and I said I was the wolf, if anybody's seen, right? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like kind of like that, oh yeah, my mom likes Pulp Fiction. I'm like, that's rude, okay? <laughs> but anyway, um, we don't always know what work, creative works best, right? For your audience or a placement. What do we do when like we don't know how what creative is working best, but we test, right? And we test and we manually test. So it's time consuming and it's kind of a pain in the ass basically, right? So you're, you're A-B testing, you're building fully formed ads, and then you're testing over and over again, rinse and repeat kind of thing. So we can make creative permutations of ads using kind of different constraints, whether it's on bidding, whether it's on targeting, or whether it's on audiences. And this can kind of help solve the issue, right? So that's why there's some hope with dynamic creative, right? It allows us to identify and target right audience, right placement, and actually know like what's performing best uh, for our campaign. So how does it work? We're looking at breaking an ad, as I mentioned, into the most basic components, right? So we have titles, we have images, we have videos, we have your calls to action, we have your text, like any, any characteristic of the ad itself, basically. And then again, it's exploring and spending on these ads uh, for any given impression, right? Um, so we're looking at the different users, the different placements that you're running, or the different types of objectives that you're running your campaign. So you can even see when we get down to workflows, how much easier and, and how much simpler this slide is uh, as opposed to like the, the DCO slide and display, right? We're looking at, you know, currently you specify your targeting, you build your ads and you monitor and you adjust as you're just putting ads, fully formed ads into the market. Um, with a dynamic workflow, you're still specifying your targeting, but then you're uploading a feed of assets and then the system is optimizing. And then it's serving the best performing combination of these assets to the target market. Um, setup is easy, and if you're using Ads Manager, I have like just a quick guide here so you at least kind of know what's going on there, but you would set up your campaign as normal, right? So again, I've been using traffic as an objective, say that's our objective, we're hitting our campaign there. You would run in and you would, you would still, you know, set up your campaign as normal, whatever kind of taxonomy you're using to signify what campaign it is. But then, there's a little button that says Dynamic Creative, and if you toggle that on, it will enable this. For campaigns later uh, as you start building out those campaigns. It's right up where you would set your budget and your schedule basically. 
So you keep going on as normal. You're uploading any of your applicable audiences, any CRM lists, any native targeting, any types of updates there. And then you're kind of going on and building your campaign. Then it starts to get a little bit different to where you're not just uploading one thing, you're uploading multiple things, right? So if we have multiple images that we want to kind of, kind of go through, multiple videos, you should be using video, by the way, because static images don't do as well. I, Anybody tells you anything, tell them they're a liar. They said otherwise. I'm not this much of an asshole in my real life, I promise. Like I get up here and I sound like one. Um, but you know, same thing goes with your text, right? So you can have different blocks of text, things that are relevant to your ad. Um, you would upload different headlines, different descriptions. Um, your destination URL, you only get one. And I think this is important to kind of talk about because there's a layer of complexity. Say you were tracking towards multiple URLs, right? Like if you work in social and you're, you're a marketer, what's your job but is to make somebody take an intended action on that ad? When, when it goes to the websites, right? Like say you're trying to get somebody to click to the website and take, that's UX's problem. I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't become your problem by proxy, right? But like that is like the web team's problem. So eliminating that kind of uh, discrepancy with URLs, I think is, is huge. So it's only gonna track towards one URL. And then of course, calls to actions, which I kind of love because sometimes you spend, um, especially like in the e-com space, we spend times deliberating over like, I don't know, does shop now work better than download or this or that, just put it in, let the system figure it out and stop arguing about it, right? And then you just publish, that's it. You hit the publish button, publish your ad. Um, it's important uh, after you do this, though, uh, to like go on and just kind of marinate on that for a little bit, um, especially if you're running like, say, like promo campaigns, you know, say like you're a clothing retailer or something, you have like a sale over the weekend. Um, probably not a good use here because you still want to give the system time to optimize. So if you're like one of those clients that's going, hey, this has been live for four hours and we're not hitting our goals and what the hell the sky is falling kind of thing, then at least like, okay, probably not the best for you in that moment. But if it's a longer term campaign and you're letting it run for at least like seven to 10 days, then you're, you're probably good and you're starting to see results. Um, in terms of seeing your results, it's pretty easy, right? So you go up to breakdown and you break down and sort by dynamic creative element and then the different elements come up. You can download the data, you can pivot the data, and you can start kind of seeing where your benchmarks are and where you're either meeting, uh, succeeding, or well below those KPIs, so you can kind of adjust, have a winner. I like this because what can we do then? But then we take all this information about what creative is, is performing best, and we actually just flip right there, put it into our evergreen campaigns, then we have a better baseline for what campaigns that we're building after that. Um, so it's basically simple. Right. Uh, you know, you, since we're not relying on fully formed ads, um, it, it kind of simplifies our, our, our time that we spend deliberating on things. and We can get more time into like building things, putting them out in the market. Right. So then we're leading with performance led creative. So we know where the combinations of this creative goes. Uh, we're driving performance through the campaign this way. Uh, again, the quicker launch times, right? So everybody's not kind of bitching at each other in the back end. And then you're boosting your performance, right? So you're delivering the best creative uh, for the campaign each time around. Um, just to kind of hammer home, home on those parts, uh, efficiency is great. This is an efficient thing to do because you're gaining efficiency through the automation of your system, right? Um, so you're freeing up time for the media side and the creative departments to kind of like just be harmonious with one another. <laughs> so <laughs> that creative then is, is highly targeted that way, right? So again, like the right creative reaching the right person. Um, your ads resonate better. So oftentimes you do see a little bit ROI if that's kind of your jam. Um, and since you're getting better insights, then again, what are you doing to taking this data and running it back into your campaigns uh, and when, you know, what you know about people in the future? Here's a quick cheat sheet. If you're running uh, dynamic campaigns in Facebook, uh, you've got a conversion objective, a traffic objective, video views, reach, brand awareness, and app installs. Those are the only types of objectives that you can run this pay campaign on. Again, there's up to 10 different images or videos. I mean, think about with display, while I was talking about DCO, it can just the possibilities are endless. It can be a nightmare. Here, it's like you're limited to 10 
pick the best and then go through it, right? Um, you have up to five different versions, your body text, titles, descriptions, and CTAs, and as I mentioned, only one destination URL. Uh, it's really easy to get started. We kind of went through it, but you create your, di your desired campaign, you toggle it on, you upload everything, and then you kind of go. So how do we bring this to action then? It's a collective effort between the creative side of the house and the media side of the house. And I think both kind of areas have, have certain responsibilities that they have to kind of follow through on. Um, so the creative side, you're providing obviously the images or the videos or whatever, whatever it would be, right? <laughs> Believe it or not, the creatives are making the videos. Um, you're providing the ad copy. You're working with the media team to kind of understand the target market so you can create best to what you think is going to work. And then you're also setting and tracking any sort of creative KPIs. Now, if you're on the media and the execution side of the house, you're providing metrics from similar campaigns. Uh, if you're working on DCO, set the partner, like please don't let the creative team set it. I can't stress this enough, set it yourselves. Um, provide any audience data, you're going to work on the, tech, the tactical execution, and any KPIs or any reporting your media team should be owning um, because you're ultimately responsible for the success of that campaign. So um, when it comes to retargeting, as I mentioned, this is absolutely huge. It is absolutely a, a good way to use this, right? So you have, um, oh, how am I on time? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> so retarded, right? So I mean, think about it like a traditional funnel, right? Like you're hitting people very broad uh, in the, the uh, top half of the funnel. Uh, when you're in prospecting, they start getting narrower, and by the time you're retargeting, that you want like super high quality. That way, if you're on a conversions objective, you're measuring cost per order. You want these people to buy your product. Um, in DCO, you can use this in like a cross-sell, upsell kind of capacity. I like this because machine learning can kind of suggest products, or if you're in the B2B space, uh, if they're like intangible products, right, that are more like goods or services, it can suggest this to people. Um, as I mentioned, it should be a baseline for future full funnel campaigns. So any of the data and any of the learning that you're getting, uh, make sure you, you let that guide you as you, as you start, to, start to build new campaigns. And then I really like this can help you create stronger lookalike audiences. So if your audiences are targeted, niche, strong, whatever word you want to use, then when you say, okay, I want to run like a 1% of lookalike, make yours look like mine kind of thing, then by proxy, you're getting stronger lookalike audience as well. That's huge. So essentially what's happening here is we're letting the data tell a story. Uh, you're expanding on your audiences, your creatives. You're A-B testing in a sandbox. You're rinsing and then repeating. Uh, you get a stronger connection with your audiences and you're able to kind of segment your marketing more effectively. Um, so three ways that we can ensure success um, and that you don't have clients just absolutely losing their mind at you when you're launching these campaigns. Uh, first of all, set realistic timelines, right? From genesis to launch. And this needs to include creative production timelines and then any trafficking timelines. So if your media team know, or your creative team, for example, knows that like to, you know, film and edit videos or whatever, and we're adding maybe three or four more than we would normally in a campaign, they need an extra week, then we need to make sure that we're actually building that into kind of our media plan. Um, then you want to manage expectations when you're in market, right? Um, as I mentioned, you have to give the platform time to optimize. This isn't something that just happens, uh, you know, in a matter of hours. So if it's at least like seven to 10 days, then make sure this is something that you're communicating as you build and set these live. Uh, and then determine KPIs, right? And then stick to them. So again, if there's some vanity awareness metric in the top funnel, if there's a traffic metric in the mid funnel, and then a conversions or purchase objective in the lower funnel, then make sure you're setting your benchmark and sticking to these KPIs and determine a winner. Don't try and pull the trigger too early and, and melt down if things are going your way, let the system optimize and then stick to your guns there. So I, I hope this kind of helps you in summation, in summation understand some of the value while we're creating this personalized scale, uh, you know, personalized experience and scale for people, right? So it's it's about just kind of really, really honing in on targeted creative for people. Um, taking a new approach to your, your marketing campaigns and your lower funnel tactics, so really trying to understand more about the people that are most likely to kind of convert. Uh, work on crafting better user personas, uh, and then make sure that you're planning for campaigns better so you don't have creative and media teams just passive aggressively fighting over email kind of thing. Um, that's, that's it, that's, that's the talk. Uh, that's me on Twitter and Instagram, should you wanna see more about how boring my, uh, my life is. But uh, I really appreciate the, 
the time that I got to spend with you guys today. So thank you so much. I hope you have a great rest of the day. I mean, sure. If there, if there are questions, sure. Put me on the spot so I can just, <laughs> just borrow them. So we'll see. If I'm Close toss. Um, we work in a compliant, in a highly compliance-driven uh, industry. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice for those of us that are in uh, financial services or insurance around how to get this through a compliance team that is used to reviewing a static uh, advertising? So, so is the problem like that they're like when you say static, you mean images as opposed to video, or do you mean? Yeah. So we've got someone. No, even in that case, we've got someone that wants to see the actual ad that would be presented to a customer mm -hmm. so that they can make sure that it's compliant. Mm -hmm. uh, well, first, I find a crisp hundred dollar bill. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> you might have to like almost take them through a sample campaign. Like I would, I would actually show them how all the elements are, right? Like if everything is going to be like in compliance, no matter what, like, right? Like you're not, it's not going to be some far out messaging or something of that nature. You can almost kind of build mocks I would, if they're like a visual learner i would almost do that right because then it's just how do you appeal to people um i had a similar kind of pain points running this on a, a very rigid very uh enterprise b2b account you know what i mean and and the best way there was almost the efficiency and time argument right like we could get around it because i was like what are we what are we going to do that would be out of compliance like we're not going to we're not going to do that kind of thing right um, the, the creative is going to be, you know, lots of standards, everything's going to be brand safe, that kind of thing. But actually, I would look at, like, how much time your teams are spending sometimes doing this kind of stuff and saying, like, okay, like, we will get better data on, on the back end, and I think that's the play. It's not necessarily, like, let's look at what this is going to look like, but actually, like, saying, like, we will get better data about our users by running these campaigns. Let us just try to send the best parts and then go from there. So that's actually the angle that I would probably take, and I, I did take the kind of kind of wing over.